Let's take a look at some information and charts on Terra for Brave New Coin. So Terra is a proof of stake token. So we'll take a look at the info surrounding that. They've got some DeFi NFT stuff. We'll take a look at TVLs and things of the such and the like. They also are a cross chain bridge capable chain, which is very hot right now. Very flavor of the month type of stuff. Soul FTM. We have this, this yin and yang between bridging and ETH layer two. If ETH layer two is successful, arguably, then bridging will be less of a necessity. Bridging is important if ETH fees are high or any dominant layer one chain has high fees. As you can use a bridge to do stuff much cheaper, you can participate in ecosystems much cheaper. You can plop your TVL in APYs in different places much cheaper. And I'd say the top two protocols on Luna are probably Anchor and Mirror, as uh, this infographic by Block49 illustrates. They're talking about uh, Anchor being a moneymaker, Mirror being, being similar to synthetics, based on what I can uh, see, whereas Anchor is more of like an Aave or lending and borrowing. Uh, Mirror is synthetic assets. The other big thing that I know of Luna for would be stable coins, where you can um, swap Luna for a one to one algorithmic stablecoin UST. There's always uh, interesting dynamics there with algorithmic stablecoins and the history of algorithmic stablecoins failing. So there's always, you know, that risk. I think everyone's waiting. Not everybody. Maybe just me. Maybe I'm the doomer. Ultimately, I want everything to fail once first before I go all in and get rich quick. But it's dangerous to have uh, algorithmic stuff connected like that, uh, as we've seen in the past with other algorithmic stablecoins. They have this uh, mobile payment transaction thing. I don't know too much about it. Um, you know, obviously there are people in this ecosystem who know way more than I do about lots of things, including this uh, chain. So I'm sure somebody in the comments will let us know. Uh, as far as I know, most of this stuff happens in South Korea. So it's a bigger market there than it is in the West, as far as the East-West uh, dynamic goes. I haven't heard too much about it other than uh, really Anchor and Mirror. So they do have validators just like uh, EOS, Tezos, Delegated Proof of Stake. You know, you can read into it. Everybody has their slight different take on things, whether it's the top 10 validators, top 21, top, in this case, 130. You want to make sure most of them aren't exchanges. Most of them aren't located in Asia. Most of them are decentralized in ideologies. Don't have a bias towards one specific thing if you are more than 51% of the voting power. That's the ideal situation. EOS, for example, is mostly Asia, mostly exchanges. That is just a recipe for disaster in all sorts of ways from a decentralization vantage point. Um, like I said, they do have a stable coin. I'm not going to go into it, but it is seemingly complex. And ultimately, we won't, I don't think we'll really know the weaknesses until it actually has a weakness or shows a weakness that's exploitable. I can't remember the names of the other ones that have uh, sort of exploded, not uh, Tether or USDC, but uh, actual algor algorithmic stablecoins. Um, and even they say here, it's impossible to design a perfectly stable asset under all conditions. Um, the big thing with stablecoins has always been market rate, which is usually relatively volatile around a dollar. And then the redemption rate, which is ideally always been a dollar. There are a lot of people who don't participate in the stablecoin ecosystem in a big way who are always commenting on what they think is the redemption rate and what is in actuality the market rate. The market rate is whatever anyone wants to pay for it. If somebody wants to pay 90 cents for Tether or Terra stablecoin and someone is selling at 90 cents, then yeah, it'll go to 90 cents, right? But ideally, it forms some sort of equilibrium around a dollar, and that is generally variable based on market psychology and what's going on with the news around this stuff, as we've seen with uh, Tether. So it's really just a confidence game. If people are confident, it's going to be worth a dollar, it's worth a dollar, right? It's just that simple. The redemption rate, ideally, though, is always a dollar. Just more quick info from Masari, really for my own edification. Again, proof of stake, delegated, stable coins, a bunch of pegged currencies through Mirror, a bunch of stable coin potentials as well. And they did two raises, which was interesting. They did a pre-seed and a seed raise as well as a private sale. 
a billion tokens circulating. I don't know what percentage of these tokens are vested or locked up or any of that stuff. That's important to know. It's important to look at and kind of like Link, right? I give Link a lot of crap for selling nonstop while they're telling people to buy and hold. So that'd be important to find out here is our employees uh, and contributors selling are, uh, is Terraform Labs selling, right? Um, the, the argument is always and will perpetually be business development. It's important that we sell here to grow the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, we get it. But uh, while well, you're becoming a multimillionaire and the coin is eventually going to take a downturn, right? A bunch of people are going to lose a lot of money. But hey, market's going to market, right? So these are all important things to nail down eventually. I think it's probably too early as, you know, we're bullish, right? If we're bullish, then uh, nobody really cares for the most part about diluted market cap or who's moving what where, right? It becomes a much bigger deal in a bear market. If you look at all the stakers, it looks like um, 337 million is being staked. APR around 3.6, which is decent relative to uh, DeFi or other APYs. And some of these are VCs. I don't see necessarily any exchanges. Huobi, there's an exchange that I recognize. But you typically see exchanges and VCs at the top of this list because they're usually holding a bunch of coin for custody reasons or they got in early as an investment, right? They don't always vote on stuff, which is good and bad, depending on how, how you want to look at that. But ideally with a proof of stake system, and this is going to be really important with ETH, if an exchange is voting on your behalf for something and you don't agree with that, vote. You need to move your ETH, your ETH or your Luna, Terra, whatever. You need to move it out of that staking wallet to take away um, the representative democracy power that you're essentially giving somebody else. And this is completely irrelevant until it's super relevant. Uh, that's just how it works with a representative democracy and uh, quote unquote decentralization and proof of stake. This is the UST uh, stablecoin. It is in the 2.7 billion range, I believe if I'm reading this right. So it's pretty massive uh, relative to everything else in the stablecoin ecosystem. And this may wax and wane with uh, APYs and the DeFi stuff and everything else that's going on between uh, Mirror and Anchor and um, insurance, which I thought everyone agreed was silly on DeFi, but we have an insurance protocol here. More and more stuff here. Here's that uh, claim about 2 million users in South Korea. You know, I, I don't have the ability to verify all these claims that I see everybody making everywhere. I don't have all the data. I'm not saying it's not correct. I just, I don't know, right? They have a payments app in Mongolia, apparently. Meme Pay. What a great name. So there are stuff and things happening, uh, but I think the big stuff is on uh, Mirror and Anchor. These are the air airdrops and snapshots that look like um, happen slowly over time based on how much Luna you're holding. So an interesting uh, concept there. Now here's the real heat of the meat, uh, the TerraSwap stuff. Volume continues to just crank at super high levels and liquidity sits extremely high. I don't recognize most of this stuff. Um, a lot of this, now uh, Uniswap got in trouble for listing synthetic assets by US regulatory agencies. Synthetics is probably eventually gonna get a slap on the wrist for doing similar things and eventually this mirror protocol stuff will definitely get a slap on the wrist for stuff like this in the US, right? If you're a US user using this, you got to know better. But these things uh, do exist elsewhere if you're not able to access synthetics and if you're not an American citizen, especially they are accessible in different places. And if we look at total TVL according to DeFi Llama on Terra, it's very near 10 billion. Most of that sits on Anchor and Lido. Remember, Anchor is the uh, lending and borrowing stuff. Mirror is the synthetic asset stuff. And this list, I'm sure, is growing uh, by the week as far as things that are more than happy to participate in, in the DeFi ecosystem in a cheaper way, to be honest. I mean, if it's cheaper, better, faster, stronger than ETH, yeah, bring it, right? That'll just push the user experience better and better and better. Ideally, the more competition, the better, the better the consumer experience cheaper the fees, that sort of thing. And we can sort of compare the TVL across the ecosystems, but I think TVL is a silly metric because at the end of the day, it's all based on incentives. If incentives are good enough for the lending and borrowing protocols on a certain pair or um, chain, then that's where the TVL is going to be. You know, it's not like, let's, let's highlight this strength here. It is all just based on incentives. Incentives make the world go around so it's interesting to look at this. I don't think it's necessarily tradable or like super bullish for Terra because it's got all these values in certain places. 
just kind of is what it is based on incentives. I think the bigger thing to watch is the differential. So if all of a sudden the lending APYs fall and this falls and the total TVL falls substantially, right? That's typically what we've seen when the incentives dry up, TVL goes elsewhere because it doesn't care. It's agnostic. You can bridge to any chain. You can put your money anywhere you want. You're going to put it wherever has a relatively acceptable risk for you personally and acceptable incentives. That's kind of it. Unless you're super connected to the community, you're not going to really care if it's on Solana or Avalanche or Phantom or Terra or ETH layer two, right? You don't care as long as you're making money at the end of the day, which is what honestly what it should be about. <laughs> uh, Terra NFT ecosystem. I don't recognize most of this stuff. I'm not super into NFTs anyway, but uh, they do have this component should you choose to participate. Moving on to technicals, I'm going to start with something I talked about in the Luna video last month, which were, we were about here around 25, I think. So it was, it was a new all-time high. And I was talking about alligator fractal uh, stop losses. Uh, we can I put on VPVR as well. And how this works is it's a set of MAs yeah, and you can use the fractal stops as trailing stop losses. So as this got higher and higher and higher, but eventually plateaued, you get more and more concentrated stop loss triggers. And eventually you do get a stop loss trigger here at around 30. So depending on how you want to trade this, you could get out, get back in. Um, but ultimately for most people who are saying they're probably just going to move on to somebody else, something else. So yeah, can this go to 30, 60, 90, 120, some multiple, of course. Uh, but when, once things slow down, once momentum slows down, like a locust, the, the trader generally moves to another patch of grass, right? They'll certainly partially take profit for the most part and deploy that capital elsewhere. So there's a potential diamond top in, in the works here. Until this breaks down or until this breaks like 35, then I'd be worried about it. Uh, but it's probably fine uh, just sitting where it's at. If we zoom way out, the 5200 EMAs are still bullish. The 200 EMA is around 20. Most of the volume historically has been sub a dollar. And then after that, around 650. So if, you know, this 20 level doesn't hold, 650 is definitely where this is headed on the downside. But trend-wise, it looks fine. Bullish, it needs time for MAs to catch up. It's probably going to bounce around these uh, monthly pivots a bit more into October. But it uh, doesn't look super, super toppy at the moment. RSI reset completely after being comp super overblown for a little while there. So this could, you know, it could consolidate and go again. It just doesn't look like... It doesn't look convincingly uh, bullish or bearish one way or the other. Cloud says it's fine. It's still above the cloud. It's still bouncing on the key June. Ideally, when you see these key June taps like you did in 2020, early 2021, you get a tap and higher, tap higher, tap higher, tap higher. Here you get a tap and a lower high so far. You know, this consolidated here even and went for another move in all these uh, near key June taps. So I'm not ruling out higher highs here. It's just, again, not, it doesn't look as bullish as it did in February. And certainly doesn't look as bullish as it did in early August when it had all this activity right above the daily cloud. On the 12-hour cloud, it's crisscrossed back and forth. So what you don't want to see is this drifting into the cloud on the 12-hour. Anything again below 30, and you're probably at risk for a drift, certainly to 20. And ultimately, lower lows, you definitely don't want to see that, obviously, if you're bullish on anything. Another way of looking at uh, these fractals, right? Right now, if you're bullish or long up here, anything below the current fractal, the trailing stop loss around 22. And it says, hey, trader, probably not bullish anymore. That's what it says. Luna BTC uh, continues to drift higher. It doesn't, again, it doesn't look as bullish as it did, um, but this can turn super quickly if this makes higher highs. You know, it is on the bullish side of neutral here as it's still above the cloud. It is at the 2618 from the previous high to low. So at some point, sanity has to kick in for most people. And they say, all right, you know, if I've if I've been in it since 3K sats, how much more greedy do I want to get? I'm up a 3X since 3K sats. Do we go for 14? Do we go for 25? Do we go for the 0.1, the coveted 0.1 sats? You know, eventually more and more people start to sell as they realize uh, this thing is up significantly from their entries, right? And that's the issue with things that go parabolic super quickly. It's harder to get holders on board when they get rich so quickly. You know, that's just how it is. Luna ETH also looks fine to me. I like that it's not, it's certainly up significantly from the bottom. 
up significantly from the cloud breakout, but it's not as crazy parabolic bullish as uh, the BTC pair. So I still think it's early days for Terra. I think it's worth experimenting with any and every chain if that is your interest in fooling around with um, APYs and TVL and NFTs and lending and borrowing and synthetic assets, right? And whatever floats your boat, it's all here for you if that's in your wheelhouse. Lastly, I'll just mention the ETHBTC fund and DeFi portfolio. I trade for Techme Capital and Enzyme.Finance, a non-custodial portfolio management tool where you can see everything, including AUM performance allocation. You can see all the vaults in that I'm in here on ETH. Now, ideally, something like Enzyme eventually goes multi-chain. We get some crazy bridging arbitrage opportunities. We get some crazy vault APY opportunities, right? Then comes risk. Then comes attack surface, you know, th this adds complexity to everything. Um, but even for me as the, the administrator or the trader of this thing, fees are incredibly high uh, using ETH. And uh, lastly, you can just see the trades and the trades have down below as well. That's all for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe. Happy trading.